Hey, Josh. Uh, microphone. Or Scott Marshall. Hey. How you doing, guys? So, uh, just coming on early to get everything set up. Uh, make sure sound's on, video's on. We'll be starting about midday, but probably won't start... The, uh, not midday, one o'clock. Sorry, that was last week. Uh, probably won't start the stories until about five minutes past, just to let everyone arrive. Couple of things I need to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm suffering at the moment. My lungs are a bit... A bit tight last couple of days, so I'm keeping a check on myself. And my energy levels have been absolutely rubbish. Ah, so I'm just uh, making sure everything's working, everything's nice and tight. That's okay. Ooh. What's going on here? No, that's fine. Good. Bum, bum, bum. Ooh. She knows. Okay. Don't touch your face. You're not supposed to touch your face. I'm terrible at touching my face. Um, I really am awful and I do it all the time. So, oh my goodness. How's everyone's energy levels at the moment? Mine have just plummeted the last couple of days. I don't know if it's because we've just been so isolated, so shut off for so long now or um whatever but i have just wanted to do nothing but sleep now for two days uh how's everyone else feeling out there rhiannon oh hello oh rhiannon hello from my um cochran yes cochran library yes i'm right yes getting myself all ready here just pulling up my phone again folks it gives me an idea of what's happening because, as I say, I don't see anything on uh, my live screen, screen. So it's nice to... Where am I going to put this, though? Here. Excellent. Yep, yep. Uh, I've slept all week, Zoe. Oh, my God, yeah. Um, oh, hi, Zoe. <laughs> oh, my goodness, right. Yeah, that took me a minute to register. Um, lovely. Um, yeah, yeah. Chelsea, lovely to see you again. Yeah, I've been exhausted. The last couple of days, uh, like yesterday, all I wanted to do was sleep. And this morning I have been fighting. And the downside to that is when you're trying to... Evelyn, oh, you're still alive in North Berwick. Lovely. Um, when you're trying to remember and practice stories, there is nothing worse than being like exhausted and tired because your brain just turns to fuzz. And I've been like, oh, all morning I've been trying to work on stories again just to make sure I had them. And I mean, honestly, I'm, oh, it just feels like, uh, it feels like Calgary. It feels like the snow in my head. Um, for if you're not familiar, folks, or you're not from the Calgary or Canada area, we are once more a beautiful winter wonderland this morning. Yes, spring is definitely not happening yet in this side of the world. Lorna, hello, hello. Whew. I promise you I will have energy for this. Oh, I'll get myself going in a minute. Ha. So, folks, that's uh, one o'clock. We're going to wait for about five or so minutes before we really kick off with stories. And that's just to allow people to kind of get on uh, and get themselves comfortable. So a couple of requirements. Uh, make yourself comfortable. If you happen to have meat, get a glass of meat. If you don't have mead, and I mean mead, M-E-A-D, not meat. Whenever I say this at Viking events, people think I'm saying meat because of my accent. If you don't have meat, uh, mead, <laughs> oh God, it's going to be one of those days, folks. Gla grab a beer, grab some wine or a coffee. Just make yourselves comfortable. Uh, Carla, hello. <laughs> oh, so glad I'm on. Oh, you're on your lunch break. Oh, well, thank you for joining. Thank you. Catherine's joined as well. Lovely. Ah, uh, good. So everyone looks like they're very sleepy. Brooklyn, hello, hello. Everyone's kind of saying that they are quite tired and sleepy now. And I think this isolation is, uh, it's messing us up. I mean, so many times it's two in the morning and I'm like still awake. Me and my wife were just kind of like, oh, you know, it's just throwing everything, everything to pot. So, ah, uh, it's it's just kind of 
I don't know. We'll get there, folks. We'll get there. Ah, <sighs> not helped by the grey, drab weather. There is Calgary at the moment. I mean, we had two days of sun. I was out on the pat the deck, the patio. Listen to me. You can tell that the UK uh, Canadian lingo sometimes gets confused. We were sitting out in the deck the other day reading, and it was lovely. And then, of course, this uh, Liam. Ah, get a tall, frosty glass of meat. Yes, I do mean mead, okay? Um, yeah, I'll explain that in a minute, folks, you know, just once we get started, because there's some moments in my life that just, uh, it's ridiculous. Oh, Joshua Nicholson. Mm. Now, there is a young lad's name from the past. How you doing, bro? Nice to see you. Got your whiskey, lovely. Wow, this is nice. So I've actually got people from the UK here, uh, Scotland for Josh. Um, we've got uh, Zoe is down in England, if memory serves. Um, da, 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 da. I'm just double checking anyone else. Cochrane, uh, Calgary, Edmonton, um, Sedgwick. Yep, yep. We've got we've got a nice. Apparently, my mother might be tuning in as well, but she won't say anything because she's really annoyed that I got everyone to like type hello Callum's mum in the last one. Look at that. There's Nick from uh Witaka Waka Waka Waskawin. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Are you guys not got any snow up there, Lorna? Oh, God, that's ridiculous. York. That's it. Yeah. I knew you were somewhere down there, Zoe. Uh, Wisconsin. Ah, lovely. God, we've got, we've got a nice variety of people here. Oh, this is good. This is good. Uh, Excellent. I also, um, it's, it's kind of weird when I do these events, these big ones, I uh, post out to a couple of famous people um, to join us on uh, Instagram. And it's not because I'm wanting that kind of a uh, media thing. I'm kind of just like, these guys have been doing really cool stuff for years and entertaining us. And now they're kind of stuck like the rest of us. So it's kind of nice to uh, give back. Cassandra, lovely. Uh, Ryan Reynolds, I don't think, joined last week. But this week, because I'm doing Viking stuff, I actually, uh, I decided I couldn't resist it because I love them. I love I love her music and I love his literature. And of course, they're married, so it made it really easy. But I thought I would kind of put a message out to Amanda Palmer and uh, uh, Neil Gaiman. Uh, because, you know, I also know that they're kind of stuck. They got trapped a wee bit in New Zealand, I think. Well, not trapped, but they got delayed in New Zealand with all this craziness. So they're kind of isolated out there as well. What else we got? Jessup. Oh, Jessup. Hello, Jessup. Cassandra's there. Bob the K. <laughs> Have you still got that muckle old thing, Josh? Oh, man, that's excellent. Oh. Uh... I, uh, I used to have a collection of walking canes back in Scotland, and when I was traveling, I gave a few away, and Josh got Bob, which was my big muckle skull cane. Um, it was beautiful. It was a, uh, oh my goodness, it was a, uh, the, 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 the actual metal skull was made out of a, uh, it wasn't Damascus, it was something else. It was a, it was a forging steel. So it was beautiful, absolutely stunning cane, really nice, flexible. Oh, it was it was perfectly. Uh, no, don't switch to Instagram. I'm not on Instagram. Um, I did. I can't do Instagram live, uh, Rhiannon, because for some reason it doesn't let me record fully. So this is it's only on Facebook Live. This, um, so that's the only place I do it because uh, I am. I'm good with technology, but for some reason, Instagram's not working for me. It won't record and uh, allow me to upload my videos on it when I'm doing them live. Yeah, I know it's pretty early in New Zealand. We're talking about probably six, seven in the morning. Um, but you know what? I like to put that offer out because they've been doing some, I, as I say, I just, these famous people are kind of stuck as well. You know, we're all, we're all equal now and it's nice to give a little bit back. But we are upon the hour or just after the hour, folks. So let's kick in with um, some stories. As I say, I hope this goes well today because I am really tired, like a lot of us are. I don't know what's going on. Uh, everyone's energy levels are dipping. But, um, oh, mum. Hi, mum. <laughs> but basically, if you don't know me, most of you probably do. I'm Callum Lycan. I'm a Scottish storyteller. Uh, I now live in Calgary. 
And basically, I've had the joy of traveling all over uh, in many countries telling stories. Now, the reason I'm doing Viking stories today is because I am Scottish and we have this amazing connection in Scotland with the Viking, the Norse sort of communities. We have a huge historical connection as well as the mixture of bloodline that's there. I was making a joke though um, about... <laughs> Oh, sorry, I just saw a comment there about my mum. Oh, it's Callum's mum. Uh, about um, meat and mead. Now, Nick, who popped on, um, I, I believe he's probably still here, will know exactly what I mean. We do a lot of uh, Viking events all over Canada. We're part of a, a reenactment society. And basically, uh, reenactment, yeah, yeah, historical reenactment society. So I do a lot of the fight calling. Uh, so when the guys are fighting, I get the pleasure of standing back and doing the announcing and just having fun and, and, and making fools of them when they're trying to be really professional. And one of the things that we do is when, a, when somebody gets killed, you know, we, we make that kind of joke, you know, how do you bring a fallen warrior back from the dead? Well, you give them their favorite drink, which in the Viking world, oh, storytelling Alberta, hello guys, which in the Viking world is mead. De mead. <laughs> and I have to emphasize that. So the drink, the honey wine, mead. The problem is when I'm very excited and I'm like roaring and bellowing and getting the crowds going, quite often it comes out as meat. <laughs> um, and you can see the confusion in everyone's faces. And of course, the field, the fight field get to give it back to me for the first time. They get to give me abuse back because all of a sudden, I'm basically shouting meat, 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 instead of mead, mead, mead. No, not the Society of Creative Anachronism. They're stick fighters. We fight with real weapons. <laughs> sorry, sorry, any SCA fans, guys out there. That's me only teasing you, of course. Uh, oh, excellent, Kevin. Nice to see you. Uh, so, yeah, that's just me explaining why um, and why. Why every so often when I say mead, you might think I'm saying meat because of the Scottish accent really kind of throws it off. But let's get into some stories, folks. And this, um... <laughs> I know, Jessup, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing about the SCA. Um, this session uh, is going to be a blend of uh, North mythology, a few Scottish Norse crossover tales, and a few folk tales from the Scandinavian kind of communities. Uh, some of these stories, I'm going to be brutally honest, I have never told live. I know them, I've read them, I've rehearsed them. I've never told them. So I don't know how some of these are going to go. So this is actually going to be quite a fun little event for me today as well. But we're going to start with well, we're going to kind of go back to the beginning. We're going to start with uh, one of those origin stories that exist out there. And it starts with King Frodi. Now, King Frodi was beloved. He was the sort of king that was loved by all his people, and he was a generous and benevolent king. And it so happened that people loved to give him gifts. They would travel all over to come to his kingdom and basically give him a gift of gold or beautiful artwork. They would just bestow wealth upon him. And it so happened that one day a great millstone was discovered, the millstone Grotti. And of course, who should be worthy of this but none other than Frodi? Because it was said that this millstone would grind out whatever its owner asked of it. So Frodi accepted it, and he was so excited to receive such a beautiful gift. So he got his men, his soldiers, and he asked them to start grinding the millstone. But it was so huge, it was so heavy, that no man could turn it. He called for great heroes and warriors to come to his kingdom, and one by one they all failed to turn grotty. Well, Frodo, Frodi was so disappointed in this, so sad that his gift could not be turned. So he sent out messengers throughout the lands looking for people of great strength and stature to turn the stone. But one by one his messengers returned, for there was nobody that they could find had the strength to turn Grotty. Well, 
It just so happened as all hope was lost. One messenger returned. He had discovered two giants, two lady giants by the name of Fenya and Menya. Beautiful women, strong and tough, but they were giants and they felt that they could turn this stone for the king. So they were invited to the lands. They were feasted, they were dined, they were treated well. And then King Frodi asked them to turn the stone. And because they were such strong giants, they started to turn and turn the great millstone. And Frodi asked for gold. He asked to test it with gold. And of course, as it turned, gold started to pour from the millstone. And before Frodi knew it, his storerooms, his treasuries became full with gold and riches. But then everything started to go wrong. For you see, Wealth and riches like that can turn a good heart bad. And Frodi started to covet all this wealth. He started to see his kingdom becoming rich and wealthy. His halls were coated in gold and gems, and he became greedy. Soon before they knew it, Fenya and Menya were enslaved by King Frodi, and the once kind and benevolent king became tyrannical and evil, constantly demanding gold and jewels and wealth to be ground from Grotty. Well, as the days passed and the giants begged and pleaded for a rest, please let us lie, let us rest for a moment. But Frodi cared not for them. He only coveted his wealth. You can rest for as long as a cuckoo crows, would be maybe the term. Well, as you know, the cuckoo is a silent bird at times, making its noise, but it never rests from making its noise. So basically, the two giants were forced continually to grind and grind and grind until they could bear it no more. One night, as they ground away, they whispered and talked to each other and decided it was time they must seek their vengeance and release. They called upon Grotty and they asked the stone to grind out a great war host. And as they said this, slowly but surely turning the stone, a great army flowed out of Grotty, filling the oceans around the kingdom with boats, with men, with swords and spears. And finally, from the stone came the great my singer, the Sea King. Now, the two giants smiled, realizing that the release would soon be imminent as a great battle ensued. Frodi and my singer's men clashing on field, on ocean, on the castle walls, but the strength in numbers that had been released from the great world stone flowed over Frodi's kingdom until eventually all were slain, including the king himself. Fenya and Menya felt so sad for what they had done, but they realized this was their freedom. This is what they had to do to survive, to be free to roam the earth. But that was never the plan of the great sea king, my singer. He took the two giants captive and placed them on his vessel, and they sailed into the ocean, and he demanded that they grind them salt. Grind him salt, for salt was what wealth was made of. This was a coveted thing around the world, and he knew that if he had salt, he could sell it and make his fortune. So now the two giants, Fenya and Menya, miserable and sad, were forced day and night to grind and grind, and salt flew from the millstone. Now there came a point that boat upon boat upon boat in the great fleet became overladen with salt and they asked the sea king is there anything else you asked for but his demands were for salt keep grinding the salt and slowly but surely the salt came and the boat started to get heavier 
and heavier and heavier in the water until the day came when the salt kept flowing that the boats finally succumbed and sank down into the depths of the ocean and down they drifted to the bottom of the sea but still the two giants kept grinding and grinding and salt poured out and poured and poured and filled the water and flowed through the oceans and it's said that to this day, those giants still are at the bottom of the sea, grinding and grinding, and salt continues to flow. And this is why the sea is salt. And if you don't believe such a tale to be true, we actually have proof in Scotland, or should I say, in the oceans just beyond Scotland, there is a great whirlpool still to this day. It is called the Corryvecian, and if you were brave enough to dive down into the whirlpool and head down to the bottom, what you would find would be a boat. And in that boat you would find two giantesses still turning and turning and turning the great millstone grotty, still releasing salt into the seas. Thank you. Why the Sea is Salt is a, a very old, uh, I think it's from Denmark it originates actually. Uh, it's one of those kind of old origin stories. There's a couple of variations of it. There's a Christmas variation as well, which is very interesting. But I prefer the old kind of Nordic one. You know, a bit of battle, a bit of gore, a bit of uh, giants, always good fun. Let's see who's joined. We've got Laurie here, Lothar, stopping by to say hello. Excellent. Okay, so... There we go. We start off with a little kind of a uh, old Dan Danish, Danish, that'd be the right word, Danish sort of tale. But we'll move on and we'll head kind of back to Scotland for a minute. You see, Scotland has a huge connection with uh, the Viking communities. There's a wealth of Norse sort of culture and influence. In fact, one of the misconceptions is that if you have red hair, uh, you're actually Scottish. And that's actually quite slightly inaccurate because it actually stems more from the Scandinavian bloodlines. So if you are actually red haired, apart from being soulless, hi Nick, um, basically you have you have more Scandinavian bloodline in you rather than the Scottish bloodline. So um, that is one of the, the, the kind of things that a lot of people get wrong. But Scotland has a huge amount, you know, we've got the Orkney Islands, the Shetland Islands, they were strongholds for the Vikings. We have the uh, Hebridean Islands and all the kind of islands in the west coast, again, heavily uh, held by the Vikings. And in fact, they even took a kind of like Argyll, Sutherland, all those kind of coastal areas down the west coast, even to the point where I was raised. Um, I was raised in a little town called Prestwick, and across the water is the Isle of Arran, the Sleeping Giant, and it was actually held by Vikings as well. So that kind of, if you look at a map, that gives you a huge kind of swathe of a whole coastal area that has a huge Viking influence on it. Um, Sorry, my throat's a bit dry today. But there are certain clans that really originate with the, the Viking uh, bloodlines. And one of the clans that I'm uh, kind of associated with, my family, we've got McPherson, we've got McDonald kind of uh, clan his, uh, heritage, <clears throat> you know, probably through Seps more than actually direct clan lineage. But one of the clans, McDonald, is actually uh, what they call the Vikings of Scotland. Uh, them and the Maclean's are the two kind of uh, uh, Viking clans of Scotland, they say. And the Macdonalds actually have a beautiful uh, crest which still says by land or sea, particularly if it's the island-dwelling Macdonalds. But it all starts a wee bit, way back in history with a young lad, and his name was Summerled. Now, his grandfather, um, Gilly, Adam Adamnan, excuse me, and his father Gilbert all lived in Argyll. In fact, they were the, his grandfather was the Lord of Argyll. And when the Viking forces came, of course, skirmish after skirmish, fight after fight was wearing down the Scots because the Vikings were coming en masse. And eventually they were forced from their land. The grandfather, in a battle, suffered a great defeat, and himself, his son, and his grandson had to flee. 
and it was said they fled to Ireland. And there, the grandfather sadly succumbed to injuries, leaving Gilbert and Summerled the son, pining, longing for their homelands. Well, eventually they could bear it no longer, and they ended up travelling back to Scotland and expecting help, support, expecting to be able to take Argyll, their, their lands back. But when they returned to Scotland, they realised there was no hope. And they became beggars, they became wanderers of the land. In fact, they ended up taking up residence in a cave on the coastline and surviving on a meagre existence. The father, Gilbert, grew old. His fighting days were beyond him, while Summerled, it said, grew a kind of very dark and grey disposition as he pined for what he once owned, what he once had, his wealth and stature. And their life continued like this for many years. But the Vikings kept raiding, they kept attacking, they kept dominating the lands, originally just pillaging, but now they were settling. Now they were actually taking over the lands in Scotland. Now it just so happened that Summerlid's pining and longing for his lands back to be someone was soon to come through to fruition. His life was about to change and it was about to change in the strangest way. The McInnes clan, a clan which is friends now to the McDonald's, they are Seps. At the time, they were just another clan roaming the lands, but they had been fighting the Vikings and it just so happened they were out on a hunting expedition when they were set upon by a group of the Norse. And it was such a vast horde of the Norse that the McInneses, well, they were defeated in battle, they were broken and bruised, they'd lost their leader and now they were fleeing and hiding for their lives. But they also now needed a new leader. They needed somebody strong and bold to help them take back what was theirs. But none of the men felt worthy of such a role. They were warriors, they were not leaders. So they came up with a very simple and rather bold idea. The next person we meet, we will ask to lead us, be our leader and lead us into battle. It was a foolish, rather strange concept to work on, but they agreed on it. The McInnes group said, we will do this. We will we'll find the first person, we'll ask them. And of course, who should they come across? Well, Summerlid, this young man. He was fishing in one of the local rivers. He was minding his own business, daydreaming as often about his, his life that once was. When all of a sudden, the McInnes clan appear and they couldn't help but laugh because here was this lad that, to be honest, they looked upon as a bit of a simpleton because of his, his, his gloomy nature. But on seeing them and hearing this laugh, Summerlid asked, what was it? Well, well, why do you laugh at me? And the McInnes clan were forced to explain what they had agreed upon. And now, because of honour, they felt duty bound to ask Summerled, will you, will you lead us? Will you be our leader? Now Summerled sat, stood there for a moment, his line in the water, pondering this, when all of a sudden a salmon is hooked on his line. And he looks at the men and says, ah, here we have your answer. If I manage to reel in this fish for my supper, I will lead you. But if I don't, you will need to find another. And the McInneses sat and watched the finest battle between man and beast that they had seen, because that salmon was not going to be caught easy. But within an hour or so, Summerled had reeled it in, and now it was agreed upon. He would lead these men. But he asked one thing of them. Since they were asking him to be their leader, they must all individually swear their loyalty to him. And they all did willingly after witnessing such a fine battle. Summerlid told them, make camp, light many fires I shall return. And he went to the cave where his father was to deliver the salmon. And then he returned to his men to lead them in whatever exploits may appear. But it wasn't long 
until his leadership was to be challenged. Because the very next day, a great host of Viking ships were seen sailing into the coast, outnumbering Summerlid's men three to one. And the men were scared. They had no idea how they were going to defeat such a host. But Summerlid studied the terrain. He looked around him and came up with the greatest plan ever. Now, I know we've probably got a few people in the audience who might have a bit of a Norse and Viking bloodline. So I don't want to sound rude, but, you know, it clearly is the Scots are the more clever race here. Because what Summerlid did is he basically saw a great herd of cows and he told his men to slaughter them and skin the hides. Then he said to his men, march down to the beach, round the great hill and come back to where you are. And this is what his men did. For the next two hours, they marched down, came round the hill where they were hidden from view, and back up and back down and round the hill and back up. And for many an hour, they marched. And on the ships coming into the land, the Vikings stared at this great army. And then Summerlid said, take the skins and wear them far side out and march. And once more, the Scots marched down round the hill and back up. And now to the Vikings, it was another great army joining. And after a few hours of doing this, as the boats got closer and closer, Summerlin said, now turn it the smooth side to your out and march once more and of course the vikings on seeing this third great host now heading down and round and up decided there was no opportunity for victory here they were outnumbered by a great war host and they turned and sailed without a single drop of blood being spilled and the army of Summerlid cheered at his wit, his guile, his cunning, because he had won the day and not a single man had been lost. And as the years passed, this is how Summerlid did many a battle. He used his wit and his intelligence and defeated the Vikings again and again and again, until the point that even David II, the King of Scotland, had taken notice. And as Summerlid had pushed many of the Norsemen out of the islands, he was granted them as his lands, the Isle of Arran, um, all the way up to the west coast, Mull, uh, heading towards Lewis and Harris, but they had yet not been taken. And then it came to the time where Summerlid returned for all his lands back. And he asked the king for this, but of course David could not do anything because we had to expel these great warriors. Now on his native land, Olaf the Red had taken settlement. He had claimed all the islands and of Argyll and beyond, and basically he was a powerful Viking lord. And Summerlid wanted those lands. He had to have his lands back. So he thought long and hard, and he came up with the most simplest solution. There is a long tradition in Scotland called rough wooing. Okay, rough wooing. If you're unfamiliar with this, there's a few Outlander fans in the audience that would probably appreciate this. Um, it's when basically your front door is kicked in, ladies. Uh, a group of burly Highlanders charge in. They wrap you in a plaid, sling you in the back of a horse, ride you out to the middle of nowhere. You're taken off the horse, unwrapped, and hopefully presented uh, to a very handsome young Highlander who wishes to marry you. I would love to say that this was all done secretly, but or should I say um, as a surprise, but quite often rough wooing was already pre-planned. It was a way of getting someone out of a, a sticky situation or a relationship they didn't want to be involved in. So rough wooing was a tradition and Summerlid thought to himself, this is perfect. You see, Olaf the Red had a daughter. Her name was Rag, uh, Rag Hildus. Yes, always delightful names they have. And he decided he was going to perform the very act of rough wooing. He snuck to the land, he kidnapped Olaf's daughter and he sailed away and had her married to him. And I would love to say again that this was maybe a surprise for her, but history tells us that this may have already been pre-planned because it would appear that they did love each other. 
Summerlid had obviously had connections and communications with her because they had three bra sons. And of course, when Olaf died, Summerlid took over his lands and his rights and by himself became what is known as the Lord of the Isles. But Summerlid and Raghildas lived very happily with their children, but when they both died, the three boys then took the lands. And as is always the tradition in Scotland, the eldest gets the vast majority, the second gets a little bit uh, less, and the third, well, he maybe gets a pebble and a bit of soil if he's lucky. But from those three brothers, those three sons, the great clans of Scotland that we now have, Clan MacDonald, Clan Ranald, and Clan Dougal, all came into our... Um, yeah, I think it's Dougal, Donald, Donald. Memory just had a moment there, folks. Uh, came into existence and they basically took all the Isles. They went into the Glens. They basically became a very strong and dominant clan. But MacDonald, as we know, the Lord of the Isles, is still a title which is held to this day and with the great clan crest by land and sea. So there we have the kind of origins of Scottish clans actually coming on the back of Viking invasion, which I find fascinating because you would think some of them were there before, but actually a lot of the, there's quite a few clans that owe their direct lineage to the Scandinavian bloodlines and the Viking invasions and would never have happened if it wasn't for those Vikings, those pesky fellas coming across and invading and taking our land. So there you go, the origins of the clan MacDonald. <laughs> uh, Ryan, rough woo, wooing, uh, like woo, 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 <laughs> like a train. Uh, that's the best way I can do. <laughs> Chelsea, I, you know, I don't doubt it. I know you. You are very clever. Uh, oh, thanks, Liam. You answered that. That's great. So. Let's get on to a bit of Norse mythology. Um, as you guys know, I love these stories. So some of these stories, one or two of you may have heard. Uh, some of them, uh, they may be new to you, but I absolutely adore these. The first one I'd like to start with is um, basically it's the master builder. It's it's a cracking story, but the reason I'm starting with this one is, is because, you know, a lot of the stories involve a very famous Norse god. You know, uh, he's kind of, he's, he's a bear-like character, bright red hair, might have a, a carpentry tool at hand, we'll see. And I kind of want to avoid starting with him because you know what, um, he, he's a great character and his stories are amazing. But I thought I'd start with the Master Builder, which actually starts with Thor going away. Thor actually decides that he's, um, well, you can imagine killing giants gets a bit dull. So Thor actually decides to head to the mountains because he wants to kill some trolls instead. So he heads east into the mountains and that leaves Asgard, well, quite peaceful for once without the Thunderer. But it doesn't take the gods long to realise that it's a problem. Thor is actually the protector of the gods. His hammer, Molnir, is the one thing that the giants fear. And now the gods realise that if anything ever happened to Thor, they would be in a lot of trouble. And particularly Thor going on these journeys leaves them exposed. So now all the gods gather in the great halls of Asgard and they, they, they kind of have one of those debates, you know, the all fathers there, uh, Tyr, uh, Heindel, Loki's there, the goddesses, Freya, Frigg, Njord, and you know, all these wonderful gods and goddesses are there and they're all discussing the problem of Thor going away. We're unprotected were exposed if the giants ever found out they would come and kill us all in our sleep how will we ever defend ourselves without thor and then a suggestion is placed we should build a wall we should build a wall around asgard that's so tall that no giant could scale it so wide that no troll could smash through it and all the gods cheered for this was a great idea but then they got to thinking to build a wall all the way around Asgard to protect them would take some time. And when the maths were done, they estimated at least seven years. And the gods realised that was too long. And of course, seven years 
of building without a weapon in the hand makes it very hard to hold a sword or spear. At the end of it, your hands are blistered and sore. So now the gods are panicked, for they have no Thor, and there's no way they can build a wall quickly. And what are they to do? And that night, all the gods in Asgard had a very uneasy sleep. Well, the next morning, as Odin is sitting in his throne room, puzzling over this, still fretting, all of a sudden, Heimdall, the ever-watchful, comes in. And beside him is a man, a simple-looking man. And Heimdall approaches and said, All Father, this man has come to Asgard. And curiously enough, he is a builder and says he can, he can make a wall for us. He can do what we ask. And Odin is immediately intrigued and he asks, tell me, what can you do for us? And the builder stands very haughty and proud. I am a builder, your Lord, and I can build a wall in three seasons for you, three seasons. And it will be so tall that no giant can scale it, so wide that no troll can smash through it. And of course, all the gods that are now gathered are intrigued three seasons is much better than seven. Well, what is your price, they ask? What do you want? And as simple as can be, the builder simply looks at the gods and says, I ask only two things, the sun and the moon in the night sky and Lady Freya's hand in marriage. Well, on hearing this, the furore, the uproar that fills the halls of Asgard, what impudence, what cheek this builder has to ask for the sun and the moon is more than enough, but to ask for the most beautiful goddess's hand in marriage, never will she be hand married to a simple mortal like yourself. Well, the builder listens to all this. He acknowledges it. He turns, and on parting from the hall, he throws out a last comment. I shall return in the morning, and I believe you will think differently by then. And with that he was gone, leaving all the gods in such a state, stressed and worried, but furious at the cheek of this mortal. But all the while, Loki has been standing quiet in the background, thinking about what he saw and thinking about what the builder said and he steps forward and he addresses all the gods i know magic and i know of no magic that can build these walls in three seasons this mortal is more than he seems so i think we should challenge his arrogance let us agree to his terms the sun the moon and Lady Freya's hand in marriage, but we will tell him he has but one season to build these walls. Now the gods get all upset at this, but Loki calms him. It is impossible. It cannot be done. Therefore, we will have a wall started, but we will lose nothing. And when the gods start to see the logic of this, they start cheering and celebrating Loki's smarts. The, the, the most intelligent god, his cleverness wins again. So the next morning, of course, as he promised, the builder arrives and into the great hall he walks and he looks at the gods. What say you? And Odin steps up and says, we believe that you can build this wall, but we have decided because your price is so high, the sun, the moon, and Lady Freya's hand, we are asking you to build it not in three seasons, but one. And you must do it yourself and have no other helping hands, no other hands to help you. Well, the builder shakes his head and thinks long and hard about this. And then he says, can I use my horse? And the gods all think about this and they come up with a simple answer, of course. What sort of gods would we be if, if you, we couldn't allow you to use your horse? I mean, they're not using hands, therefore they cannot help you build the wall. And on this, 
The oaths were sworn. Agreements were made that the builder would complete the wall in one season. And if done so, he'd receive the sun and the moon and, of course, Lady Freya's hand in marriage. Well, the builder turns immediately and heads out of the halls. The gods are all smiling and they are thinking, <laughs> what a clever trick they have played on this fellow. And they follow him out to see him work. Well, of course, the first thing that one must do when building a wall is to dig a trench. So the builder begins. And as the days go on and the gods are joking and jesting and feasting and watching, they start to realise that this builder's working a lot faster than they thought he could. That trench, which should take months to do, within a week is already proceeding round. Asgard, it's deep enough for a wall to go into and slowly but surely it's going around the great city. So within a matter of a few weeks, the trench is complete. And now the gods are thinking, something is amiss. But, but wait, 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 no, no, it's okay. Because now... He needs to go to the mountains and he needs to hew the rock and shape it and cart it back and forth. And one man and one horse, <laughs> well, it's at least a week or two's journey up there and back. So oh, nothing to worry about, they think. And they watch this builder hook up his horse to the cart and then slowly walk up into the mountains. And the gods are so happy. For now they're thinking, he'll never finish this in one season. Not now. This, this is the longest bit of the build. And that night, after a great feast and drink, all the gods go to bed, feeling so happy with themselves. But it's about three in the morning when Heimdall the ever-watchful wakes them and pulls them from their beds and drags them out to the field in front of the great city and all the gods are in shock as they watch the builder and his horse come back with a cart laden with rock. Well, they cannot believe their eyes when he starts lifting them and placing them one beside the other, slowly building the wall and day in, day out, day in, day out, the wall starts to get so tall that a giant can't scale it. It starts to get so wide that a troll can't smash through it. And it starts to slowly encircle the city of Asgard. And as the months tick by, the gods start to panic because they see that there is a very good chance this builder will complete his task within the season. And now they start to get angry. They start to get worried. They start to think about who's foolish suggestion was this to to grant him his wish to come up with such a, a a futile plan and now now we'll be plunged into darkness forever with the sun and the moon gone now we will lose the beauty of lady freya who has made us fall so low and of course loki knows when the axe is going to fall. So he's slowly realising that it's him, that his head is going to roll for this. And he's trying desperately to sneak out of the hall before he's seen. But rough hands grab him and throw him to the floor in front of the Allfather. It is you, Loki, who have caused us this curse. Now you must resolve it. You must fix this problem before. It is too late and before we lose everything. Well, Loki agrees because he has no option. And for weeks he's puzzling and thinking, how is he going to resolve this issue? In fact, he's starting to get desperate because closer and closer it's coming to the end of the season and that wall is nearly finished. In fact, with a week to go, Loki has still not come up with a solution and he is worried. But then one day it comes to him. The builder is out laying more rocks, building the wall, and he's emptied his cart. It is time to return once more to the mountains. Well, 
he starts to harness his great horse Swat <clears throat> Swad Swadilfari. <laughs> You must excuse my pronunciations, to his cart when all of a sudden, coming out of the forest above the great fields of Asgard, is a beautiful grey mare, a beautiful horse, and she dances and whinnies about. And of course, the builder's horse, well, his nostrils start to tweak. His ears prick up as he sees this beautiful mare dancing back and forth. He starts to strain at his harnesses, and it is all the builder can do to hold on to him with all his might. But as the mare runs down and starts to run round the great horse, the builder's strength is not enough, and his horse, Swadilfari, breaks its bonds and runs. And now the mare and the builder's horse are running round the field, dancing and skipping and prancing round each other. And before the builder can get close, they have taken to their heels and headed into the forest. And now the builder can do nothing but give chase. The gods have been watching this show and they are laughing and roaring at such entertainment as they watch the builder huffing and puffing and disappearing into the forest. Well, they wait to see when he returns, but they wait all day and into the evening and still there is no builder returning. The next morning, they wait and still there is no sign of the builder. It is later in the afternoon, all of a sudden from the forest, they see him appearing once more, but he's by himself. There is no horse with him. And he trudges down the field with a face like thunder. And there's only one thing he can do. He grabs his cart in both his hands and slowly but surely starts to trudge, heading up to the mountains. And now, now the gods are jovial. Now they're happy because they're thinking there's no way we're going to win this bet. There is no way he can f finish this wall now. And they wait and the day goes by and there's no sign of him. And they wait and the day goes by and there's no sign of him. In fact, he does not reappear until there is but one day left to complete the wall. And when he reappears, Coming back down to Asgard, it is clear that there is not enough stone in his cart. And now the gods are happy. The gods start to laugh and jeer. They start to send jibes towards the builder. They cannot contain themselves. They cannot stop but ribbing him and teasing him that he has lost everything. For there is no way he can, he can fill uh, finish the great walls of Asgard. And of course, the builder on hearing this starts to get angry. He starts to get furious. You have cheated me. Oath breakers, he calls the gods. But Odin, the Allfather, steps forward. It is not us that has broken our oath. It is your horse that let you down. Nothing to do with us. But the builder is furious. He's so angry at the gods. He knows they have cheated him. He knows they have tricked him. And he gets more furious. And he's roaring and bellowing and cursing them out. But as he does that, he loses control of himself. And all of a sudden, his body starts to warp and twist and grow and grow and grow until eventually the gods of Asgard take a step back in fear as they look into the face of a monstrous, huge mountain giant. The gods cannot believe their eyes. It was them that has been tricked and Odin says so. If we knew it was the likes of you we had made a deal with, it would never have been sworn upon the oaths. Never. It is you who is the oath breaker. But this mountain giant is furious. He wants his prize, the sun, the moon, and Lady Freya most of all. And he screams and roars and demands that the gods pay him for his work, for they have cheated him. But the gods refuse. They're all now huddling, slowly trying to edge back behind the unfinished walls. But none other than Odin himself stands strong, waiting, staring down the giant. 
and the giant is angry. The giant wants vengeance, and the gods know it could kill them all. But Odin stands strong as the giant slowly starts to walk, slowly picking up pace, running towards the Allfather with a smile on his face, for he knows that he can crush this puny god. And as he's getting closer, he can't help but notice something is amiss. Because Odin is standing, still, with a smile on his face, as if he knows something. And of course, the Allfather does know something. And the giant finds it all too late. For as he picks up pace, running faster and faster towards Odin, Odin simply steps aside to reveal a figure that the giant hadn't noticed yet. And there, standing behind the old father, as big as a bear, with wild red hair, slowly winding up his arm, spinning the hammer Molnir and getting ready, is none other than Thor. Having returned that very morning, he is now delighted to see that the gods have brought him a gift. And as the giant starts to get closer and closer, his grimace slowly fades as Thor unleashes Molnir. And the master builder, it is said, did get payment that day. Not in the form of the sun or the moon or the beautiful Lady Freya, but in the form of Molnir impacting his skull and breaking it into a thousand shards as the mountain giant exploded with the impact. And the heavens around Asgard filled with cheers and roars of celebration, for once more the gods knew that they would be safe, not just because the mighty Thor had returned, but because they now had an almost finished wall to hide behind. And as they cheered and roared and celebrated, a few of them couldn't help but notice that someone was missing. The one that is always there to take credit for any job well done, who to glory in uh, a glory that is not his. And that was Loki. And then when they started to think, they realised they hadn't seen Loki for a good part of a week. And none of them knew where he had gone. And as the days ticked by and the celebrations continued, the days ticked to weeks, the weeks went on to months, and still Loki never returned. But then, after seven or eight months, he reappeared through the forests above Asgard, coming down the slope. The gods spotted him and couldn't help noticing that at his side he had a beautiful little grey foal prancing and dancing round him. And as he walked through the great walls of Asgard, admiring him, and the gods stared, they could not believe their eyes, because this foal that was nuzzling Loki, as if, well, it was kith and kin. But it was the curious thing that this little foal didn't have four legs. It had eight. And as you know, horses of today generally only have the four. So they stared in amazement at this, and Loki headed up to the great halls where the Allfather sat, and he bowed and acknowledged the Lord of Lords, and then he bequeathed this little foal, this beautiful little horse, to the Allfather. And Odin stared at it, and he looked and marvelled at this creature and watched how fast it ran round the hall, and he named it Sleepner. Schleipner, who is the horse that Odin for years to come would ride into battle, the most swiftest horse in all the lands. And this is the story, well, of how Asgard got its walls. Hmm. Or is it actually the story of how Odin got his swiftest horse, Sleipner, the horse with eight legs? Thank you. Oh, oh, who have we got here, Margaret? Um, Paul, hello, Paul. 
Paul Bassar, breach of contract. <laughs> uh, make Asgard great again. Really, Paul? Are we going there? Oh, fantastic. Excellent. So we've got a few of the Viking guys online. Uh, I, I actually appreciate that uh, Nick and Paul and maybe a few others are here because the reality is during the events at the villages they have had to hear a lot of these stories and they are probably well one sick to death of my voice and two sick to death of these stories so thanks very much for coming on and listening guys much appreciated so let's uh let's move on it gets very warm in this little room that i'm in my wee studio um so i uh i apologize about the slurps of water i don't know if you can hear them because this is the worst drinking vessel on the planet. It's it's basically big blue and it slurps a lot. Um, it's got a wee crack somewhere as well. So every so often there's a wee shoot of water comes out somewhere and I'm like, oh, it just makes it look like I'm dribbling everywhere. Excellent. Okay. Leslie, hello. How are you? And Doreen. Oh, hi, Doreen. How are you doing? Uh, excellent. Okay. So let's move on, folks. Um. Oh, what will we tell now? I've got a wee list here. I'm just checking my list. I've got um quite a few options. I've been trying, as I say, I'm trying to include a few uh, different stories here. Let's do, um. I'm in the process. Oh, God. I've been in the process of developing a Viking CD for about two years now or more. And I just, uh, just it's not happening just through everything that's going on. Now is the perfect time to record CDs. Um, The only downside is having to do it all is a bit challenging uh, because of course here we are in these weird times at the moment where all shows are cancelled um, I don't know how my guys are going to do because for weeks before we all got put into isolation all I could see is posts are yes we'll be doing events and we'll be fighting soon and all I can now imagine is Nick sitting at home polishing his swords looking forlornly out the window kind of going what day one day sorry nick <laughs> only teasing you but i do know you like a good a, a good battle out there a good skirmish thor goes fishing really paul okay <laughs> that's not the one i was going to tell you but um okay good okay i'll take requests mike how you doing okay uh paul has asked for thor goes fishing i wasn't actually going to do this one but uh oh, it's been a while let me think okay yeah right so I should explain a couple of things. Okay, let's let's now if we're going into a proper full on Thor story, I need to make a few points here. The Thor that everybody is now seeing in popular culture is not Thor. Okay, I want you to understand this. Um, Marvel have done very well using some of their comic book characters, but that is not Thor, right? I'll I'll just make things clear, right? One. He doesn't have blonde hair. Two, he is not Australian. Three, he is not an Adonis. And four, he is definitely not Chris Hemsworth. And if ever Chris Hemsworth perchance saw this, please don't beat me up because that would be really easy for you. But um, basically, uh, Thor in the traditional Norse mythology is a bear of a man. I mean, I kid you not, probably the newer, the, um, the last film they did, which is my mind has uh, uh, slipped what the name was, when he was a bit bigger. Thor is a bear of a man. He's got long, bushy hair. They say he's got wild red hair, a big, bushy beard. His eyes are bright red and filled with rage and anger. He is a monster of a man. I mean, he's just huge. And his whole world is just about killing giants. That's all he does. He just basically goes out, he's, he's, he's a bit fixated with drinking, eating and killing giants. That is Thor's life. He is a very angry god. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because all the stories have that similar feel to them, but one or two are a wee bit different. And he kind of goes on like all these great adventures. Thor's one of the best Norse characters for a lot of the stories. I mean, don't get me wrong, the Apples of a Dune is an amazing tale. Um, and you've got the death of Baldur are beautiful, but a lot of them revolve around Thor. And Thor goes fishing is just another really nice, simple one. And it starts with Thor, again, being bored. You know, he, he's, he's killed giants for years and he, he decides he wants to try his hand at something different. So he thinks to himself, he wants to go fishing. 
He has a prize in mind, and actually he's got a special place on the wall of his hall for this prize. So Thor decides, I'm going to go fishing. But he needs the help of one of the greatest fishermen in all the realms. And that happens to be a giant called Himner. Now the problem with this is, all the giants know Thor and fear Thor. So there's no way Himner's going to help him. So Thor has to disguise himself. And of course, Thor, big, bold, bushy and wild looking man, well the best disguise. He comes up with, I'll dress myself as a merchant. And he puts on silk robes and satins. He basically ties back and pleats his hair. He ties his bushy beard and pleats it down. And as he looks in the mirror with his oiled hair and beard and all these fancy clothes on, even Thor doesn't recognize himself. He takes his hammer molnir and slips it inside the shirt and he's ready to go. And now Thor strolls out across the realms, heading towards Jotunheim, the realm of the giants. It takes him a few days walk and a couple of days sail, until he eventually hits land again. And as he keeps walking in the distance, he sees a beautiful house on the hill above the ocean. And he knows he has found Himner, because of the great herd of cattle that surrounds his home. Himner loves fishing, but he loves his herd of beasts as well. And Thor walks up and knocks on the door, and Himner answers, and looks down at this foppish human. And of course, Himner hates everything. Hates visitors. Loves fishing. Loves his cows. Can't be done with the rest of the world. And he looks at this puny looking thing and says, you're not welcome here. Be gone. But of course, Thor's ready for this. But, but, but I'm, I'm only looking for a, a bed for the night. I'm, I'm a bit lost. Maybe just to warm myself by your fire in a bed. And of course, Himner is like, no, you're not welcome. Be gone. But the laws and customs of the lands means if a stranger comes to your door, you need to show them hospitality. But Himner's determined to avoid this, but eventually after minutes of arguing back and forth, he agrees that he needs to allow this man into his home. So begrudgingly, he lets him in. He gives them a little bowl of food and then directs them to a room with a stone bed and says, you can sleep here. Thor is grateful and Thor starts to get himself ready for bed and he's chatting as nicely as he can to Himner all the time trying not to pull out Molnir and do what he loves doing. And of course Himner's saying, ah, you'll not get much sleep here anyway, you'll regret staying here, the cows will keep you up all night. And Thor's like, ah, that won't bother me. Ah, well, you'll get no sleep, I'm up early and away fishing in the morning. And of course, on hearing this, Thor pounces on it. Oh, fishing? I would love to go fishing. And of course, Himner, his heart sinks. Oh, and he does everything, constantly trying to dissuade the man. The sea's too rough. The fish are too dangerous. It's too early in the morning. But all the time, Thor's countering every argument. Till eventually, Himner has to agree. But as Himner watches the man go to sleep, he starts to hatch a plan. I'll just get up a little earlier in the day before this lazy thing even wakes and I'll be out to sea before he even knows. I'll get up, milk the cows and be gone. And that's what the giant does. The next morning he gets up even earlier. He heads out to his great herd to milk some of the cows. And as he's sitting down milking, he can't help but feel that he's being watched. And as he turns, his heart sinks. For behind him, he sees this foppish man leaning against the post, staring at him. And him that realises his plan has backfired. And as he watches this man in his fine clothes, he, another thought, ha ha, I'll get rid of him yet. And he points over to more, towards the, the dung pile, the manure pile. 
And he says to this man, away in, fish in there for some bait. If you're coming fishing, you'll need some bait. Away into the, away over there and, and find yourself some. Now, Thor isn't really paying much attention at this point. He's just musing away to himself. So what he actually sees is him there kind of pointing over there. But in the way is some of the cattle. And Thor doesn't realise that he's directing him to the manure pile. So Thor walks over, has a look at these splendid beasts, finds the biggest bull he can find, takes out a sword and chops off its head with one slice. Grabbing the bloodied head, he walks back to the giant and says, Is this good enough for bait? And Himner is furious. Himner cannot believe what he's just seen, his prize, beast, one of them slain by this man. This is too much. But of course he knows, he knows he cannot hurt this man. The laws of the land forbid it. But then it comes to him. But there's nothing about the laws of the ocean. So a thought comes to Himner. We'll go fishing. This man can join me. And... It may just so happen that he accidentally falls overboard while we're out there. So now they head down to the beach, Himner carrying his bait, Thor with a bloody bull's head over his shoulder, and into the boat they go. And Thor offers to row. And Himner's like, no, no, you'll be too slow. But before he can do anything, Thor has grabbed the oars and starts rowing. And Himner is amazed as the boat skims across the waves at such speed. He cannot believe that such a puny looking creature can row so fast. And soon enough, they come to a suitable fishing area. And Himner says, just this will do, we'll stop here. But Thor's like, no, 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 just a bit further, let's go out a wee bit further. And they head out that wee bit further and the waves get a bit higher and the wind blows a bit stronger. And Himner's like, no, no, we'll, we'll need to stop here now. We need to stop. But Thor again is like, no, 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 further, just a bit further. And out they go until the waves are high, the wind is howling, and still Thor is rowing out and out. And Himner's getting panicked. We'll, we'll be drowned. You need to stop. We'll be drowned. And then Himner looks about and realizes where they are. And he cries out, you need to stop. We are in the realm of Jormungandr, the great world serpent. You need to stop. And on hearing this, Thor smiles, for this is the prize he has been after. This is exactly where he wants to be, so he throws the anchor over. He grabs the biggest rod he can find, he grabs the thickest line, the biggest hook, and puts it through the bull's skull and throws it over the edge. All the while Himner is panicking, we need to turn back, we need to turn back, what are you doing? And down, 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 that head sinks into the ocean. The blood from the bull starts to drift into the water. And down at the bottom of the sea, Jormungandr, the great world serpent, sleeps. <laughs> His nose starts to sniff, the smell of blood filling his nostrils as he opens huge eyes to look around. And sure enough, dangling not far away is a bull's head. He moves towards it and with one monstrous bite, sinks his teeth into it and swallows it. And on he feeling this, the tug on the line, Thor wrenches the, the line, the, the rod, the hook embeds into the great world serpent's mouth and it opens its mouth and roars and bellow in agony. All the time the waves are bucking and throwing and Thor knows deep down in the bottom of the water he has his prize and now the fight is on. Slowly but surely Thor starts to reel and reel and reel. Himner staring in absolute shock and awe at what is happening as the waves start to rock and roll. There is a thunderous noise from under the water as slowly but surely the world serpent rises. Thor straining 
with all his might, every muscle and sinew ready to burst as he brings that great beast closer to the surface. And all the while, Himner is begging and pleading this, this, who is this man? He just cannot believe what he's seeing. And then, all too soon, a great monstrous head starts to appear from the waves. Eyes, bloodshot and ghastly. A mouth filled with teeth that could cleave a man in half as easy as anything. A breath so vile, the smell of rotting corpses, of disease and death fills the air, and poor Himner, the giant, can take it no more, and faints. But Thor, Thor is so happy, the heavens are filled with thunder and lightning as his excitement grows. Closer and closer he reels in the great serpent. Slowly he starts to reach for Molnar to deliver the killing blow. But all of a sudden, Himner regains consciousness and he looks up above the boat to see this monstrous beast looming. He looks at this man and all of a sudden it realises as he sees the hammer, the thunder, the lightning, the hair has become wild and he realises it is none other than Thor and Himner is filled with fear. He doesn't know what to do and the first thing he thinks of is grabbing his knife and hacking away at the line that Thor has trapped the serpent on. In no time at all, he's cut through the line and Thor stumbles backwards with the pressure released. And as Thor looks, he cannot but release a roar of rage as he watches his prize slowly sinking once more below the waves, and Thor knows that he will never get another chance to capture this beast, and the heavens fill with thunder, with lightning arcing across, rage fills the thunder god, and he must vent. And there is only one thing available to vent on. He turns to poor Himner, the fisherman giant, and with one mighty blow, sends him into the heavens and down into the water to sink below the depths to the bottom of the sea. But Thor is rage, he is anger, frustration. He has lost his prize, but there's nothing he can do. He's lost it. He will never get this opportunity again. So he grabs the oars and with all his strength and might, he rows back to the land. His anger is still there and he cannot control it. He destroys Himner's home. He slaughters all the cattle and still his rage is there. Still the heavens are filled with thunder and lightning as he stalks across the land, tearing out ribbons, removing silk shirts, making himself once more the wild and furious Thor as he marches home, sails the seas and once more hits his realms. In Asgard, they know he's coming. They have seen the storm gathering for days, getting closer and closer until eventually they see the Thunderer himself. Not a single god is brave enough to approach him as Thor gets closer to Asgard, enters the great walls, and makes his way to his own halls. And for days, the heavens are filled with a rage of thunder and lightning, until eventually, after a week or so, Thor's anger subsides. Eventually, he decides to show him his face again, and wander amongst the gods once more. But to our knowledge, and to the knowledge of all the gods. From that day on, Thor has never, ever gone fishing, and none of the gods have ever been brave enough to ask him. Thank you. Oh, it's getting warm in here. 
<laughs> Paul, keep that language. <laughs> Worst house guest ever. You know what? Um, there's so many good stories about Thor, and he really is, and every single one, he's the worst guest ever. I mean, he really is just um, a horrible, horrible individual, and uh, I love him. I, I think he's great. Like, the stories about him are just so much fun. You can just put so much energy and passion into them. Um, I'm going to tell two more stories, because it's getting very warm in here, and as I say, don't know about you guys, my energy is so low the last couple of days, but um, we'll finish... Uh, with one of my favourite Thor stories, and I was going to finish with that one anyway. I just wasn't going to do um, too many of them, but now, you know, I can't. The Meat of Poe I'm not going to do, Josh, Josh, because it's it's an amazing story, but it's a really complicated one. There's so many facets to it, and it's one that I'm still trying to get down properly because there are so many kind of different levels to the meat of poetry but it's a beautiful story if you're not familiar with the meat of poetry it's kind of goes into how the Acer and the vanner uh became one you know the wars between the two sets of gods finished um the it's got a great moment where they all spit into pot and from the spittle they create another well, he, they say he's a god, you know, and in later stories he's classed as a god, but they create this man of spit called uh, Kvasser, um, who basically is all-knowing. He's then killed. Uh, from his blood, they make mead. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> it's great. I mean, that's like only like a small section of the story. There's so much that goes on. I love it. Um, But basically... uh. Yeah, the meat of poetry, I'm still trying to get down properly, but it's such a good story. But it's one of those ones that it's kind of like, it's a good, I've kind of got it, like, maybe it's just my telling, but it's a good kind of, sometimes can be a good 30 minute story. You know, it, it's kind of one of those epic, kind of long-term ones. Um, Binding of Fen, I'm not going to do that one, but that is another good one. Oh, hi, Perlan, how are you? Oh, lovely. Some beautiful people on here today. Thank you very much. But I'll finish with two stories. One, we'll go back to Scotland, and then we'll finish with the ultimate Thor story that I love telling because it's just so good. But um, as I say, I've got a lot of stories that I could tell here. I've been trying to balance them out. You know, there's a, a few Scandinavian and da Danish sort of tales that I've been trying to learn. But um, what I thought I'd do is I'd go back to a, a nice kind of Scottish variant. And it involves a couple of different wonderful, wonderful um, uh, races of people. And that is the Picts and the Lachlan. And the Lachlan is a Scottish name that we have originally gave to the wild men of the north, the, the, the Vikings, these Scandinavian raiders, the Lachlan. Now, in, in Scotland, the Picts were a very mysterious race, the painted ones, the Picti. I mentioned them last week, and there's always that wee joke that I love telling, and it's all about the Roman Empire, okay? So we all know about the Romans. They marched through Europe, you know, great empire. They took down Gaul. They took down many, many a barbarian tribe. Uh, they went all the way through England and came to Scotland, and they stopped because they looked into Scotland. And it was wet, dree, foggy, miserable looking, all hilly and trees. And they're wearing sandals and they're thinking, oh, oh no. And then, of course, as they're staring into this miserable, wet wee country, it gets worse. Because coming through the woods are this, this group of wiry, wild looking men and women. And they've got bright red hair, wild bright red hair. They're painted head to toe in blue and they're as naked as the day they were born and the picks stand and stare at the romans and they waggle all three weapons at them and the romans look at the picks and the romans look at each other they look at the picks they look at each other they look at the picks, and then without pretty much saying a word, they kind of go, you know what, we've done enough, let's go back to Rome. And they never come into Scotland. And that's not exactly true, of course, because we know they did push into Scotland, but they, we also know they had a heck of a time 
in Scotland. The picked eye, the painted ones, really gave them problems, so the Romans didn't get as much of a foothold in Scotland. As some might say from a historical sense, it was close to the end of the Roman Empire anyway. I'm saying it was because of the Scots, okay? Just go with it. But there is another story that kind of says maybe why. And it's because the Picts were a fierce warrior race. They were wild, they were strong beyond their size, they were wiry and powerful. And it's said they got that from the heather ale, a mystical drink that they used to brew from the heather. And this drink would give the person that, that imbibed it great strength, great virility, and some it would give foresight into the future. The great hunt had just happened and the Pictish chief was celebrating all his men, all his women, everyone of the clan, the tribe. They had all gathered in the great halls to celebrate the hunt and feast upon the beasts they had taken down. And as was tradition on these great events, the sacred heather ale would always be brought out. And the cup would be passed from man to woman, man to woman, man to woman, each sampling the sacred drink, lastly coming round to the chief who would finish off the bowl. And as the chief stared at all his tribe, he'd squaff down the final drops of this liquid. And all of a sudden, the scene changed. He was no longer by the fire. He was no longer surrounded by his loved ones and his family and his tribe. He was standing in a field and by his side was his son. Both of them were covered in blood. Both had weapons covered in blood, but all around them were dead. His tribe all the armies of the Picti laying slaughtered and then coming towards them, huge, bulking, shadowy figures that soon revealed themselves to be the Lochlan, the beasts of the north. And then he was back. He was back in the great hall, staring at his loved ones, his son, his wife, all his kith and kin, all the tribe. And the old chief's heart broke for he knew what he had seen would come to pass he knew that the heather ale had given him foresight into the future the months passed and the old man was always weary waiting for word but passed and passed the months went until it became years and still nothing but then it came all too soon the word. A great host had landed up north. The Lachlan had come and the armies of the Picti were forming, but the, this host was so strong it was pushing through Scotia. It was killing everyone who stood against him. And now this chieftain called everyone he could, all men, all warriors that he could, and they fought a great battle when the Lachlan arrived. But the strength of the Viking armies were pushing them back and back and back until eventually all around the chief were slain but him and his son. And the chief stood as the host of the Lachlan came closer, came upon them pushing them back until behind them was the raging seas and a long drop into the water or the sharp swords of the Viking horde. And the chief, the lord of the Viking, stepped forward and he says, I have come for one thing and only one thing, the secret of the heather ale. And I have been told throughout the whole country after killing all your kind that you are the one that holds the secret. You are the only one that knows how to make it. Well, the Pictish chief knew his secret had been revealed and now he was fearful. He did not know what to do because he would rather die and bet than betray this tradition of his people. And he looked down at his son, so young, strong, but still not 
broken in battle or, or, or you know, worked in battle. And he stared at his son and fear filled his heart because maybe his son would break. If they were to torture them, maybe his son might know, might have watched his father make the heather ale and break the secret and break the oath of his people. So the old man looked into this great Lord's face and said, I will tell you the secret of the heather ale, but you must do one thing for me. You must take my child, you must bind him and throw him into the raging seas below. Once you have done this, then I will tell you the secret because I will not, I will not have him see his father betray his people. The Viking horde were shocked to hear such a thing. They could not believe what they heard, but the order was given. The young man was bound <clears throat> and with a scream, he plummeted to his death into the ocean and rocks below. The Opictus chief had his head hung low as the Viking Lord came up. Now you will tell me the secret of the heather ale. As the old chieftain's head rose, the Viking Lord stepped back in shock. He could not believe what he was seeing, for on the man's face was a smile, a grimace of joy, and he laughed out loud. My son, if you had tortured him, he may have given the secret away if he knew it. That is why I ask you to kill him, for I will never betray my people and the secret will die with me today. And he laughed and roared in joy at this, for he knew the rage of the Vikings was unleashed upon him and on that cliff top he was hacked to pieces. And with him, his honour intact and the secret of the heather ale intact and lost for all time. The Vikings had come, had laid a bloody track across the lands, and had failed in their mission to obtain this powerful drink. And on that day, on that clifftop, it said the last of the Pictish race died. But with them died the secret of the heather ale, this drink that gave them great strength and virility and foresight into the future. And the Vikings returned home brokenhearted. They tried to replicate it, but all they came up with was mead, a lovely drink, but all it does is uh, gives you a sore head the next day. And the Scots for many years tried themselves to replace the heather ale. They tried many, many things and failed until one day. They didn't make heather ale, but they made something worthy of the heather ale. Somebody accidentally was smoking some peats and uh, barleys, etc. over it. And when it was mixed together, it came up with the fire drink known to man, surpassing all other drinks, ladies and gentlemen. Because although we lost the secret of the heather ale, it forced us to create, to invent, and to come up with the finest alcohol. And it said that this is how Scotch whiskey was made. The single malts that are so famous in Scotland came because we lost the heather ale. Thank you. <clears throat> Iron Brew. Oh my goodness. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry. Someone just made me laugh while I come in there. Uh, no, Iron Brew is a different thing. That's a toxic orange hangover cure. <clears throat> Excuse me. The echo effect on my voice, really? Well, that shouldn't be happening. Or is that just your headphones? Shouldn't be any. This is a soundproof room. I hope that's just your end and no one else is getting a. Uh, no one else is getting echo. Anyway, folks, I'm going to finish with one last story. Um, <clears throat> my voice is getting really dry in here. Uh, gosh, it's getting warm. Don't worry, I'm not unwell, I'm just warm. <sighs> my favourite Norse myth mythology tale, my favourite tale of the Pantheon, is, of course, the story of Thor losing his hammer. It's one of my favourite. And it starts... Well, it actually starts with the most unlikely travelling companions. 
you see, Thor and Loki travelled a lot together. Now, it wasn't because Thor liked Loki or Loki liked Thor. In fact, it was the opposite. Uh, they didn't really like each other at all, and Thor did not trust Loki. A uh, couple of reasons, uh, if you know anything about the Norse mythology, I think probably the biggest one is when Loki coveted uh, Lady Sif's uh, beautiful golden hair. That's Thor's wife. So one night he snuck into the room and sheared all her hair off. That might have something to do with it. Uh, it might have something to do with the fact that Loki always played tricks on Thor because he thought he was smarter and Thor's a bit of a dullard at times. So basically, Thor always liked to have Loki with him to keep an eye on him. So one day they were out traveling the realms and as the sun grew high in the heavens, they both became weary and decided to seek shelter under a great tree to rest. And they fell asleep. Thor arose, refreshed, and the first thing that Thor always did when he woke up would be to, um, oh gosh, you know, it sounds awful. I'd love to say that he would reach out and touch his beautiful lady wife, Sif, but no, he always liked to reach for his hammer. So his hand snaked out for the, the shaft and there was nothing there, just grass. It snakes out the other side. And again, no shaft, just grass. Thor sits bolt upright and looks around. And of course, there is no hammer to be seen. Where is Molnir? Well, of course, when anything like this ever happens, Thor's first thoughts are Loki. So he goes and finds the god of tricks and of course grabs him by the scruff of the neck and holds him high, pinned up. Where is my hammer? But it becomes all too evident, all too soon, that even Loki knows nothing of the missing hammer. In fact, Loki looks scared at the thought because this hammer is what protects the gods. This is the hammer that smites the giants. And even Loki knows if the hammer is missing, that could spell doom for Asgard. So now the, both the gods are worried and they travel as quickly as they can back to the city. They get to the great hall and they call a council and explain that the hammer of Thor is missing. And now all the gods are in a tizzy. They're all panicking. What are we going to do if the, the giants find out? They'll kill us all. And they're, they're at a loss. Heimdall cannot see it. Nobody knows what to do until Loki steps forward. Look, I'll go search for it. I, I'll take lead. I only need one thing. I need Lady Freya's cloak of feathers. I need that to travel. For if you're unaware, Lady Freya has a cloak of feathers who's, when worn by someone, it turns them into a hawk so they can take to the heavens and fly the realms. Now, Lady Freya's no fan of Loki either, but you know what? She knows the odds. She knows the stakes here, so she hands over the cloak, Loki dons it, and he is gone into the heavens as a hawk, flying from realm to realm to realm, searching, exhausted after days of travelling. He sees a lonely giant, a monster of a giant, sitting on a hill, ripping out trees and simply whittling them into spikes for fun. And Loki lands. There is no guile. There's no cunning. He's desperate. He takes off the cloak and he looks at the giant. I am Loki of Asgard. I have come in search of Thor's hammer. It is missing. Have you seen it? The giant, for a few moments, just sits with his head down listening. And then Loki sees a smile forming his face and the giant's head raises up and a huge bellowing laugh fills the heavens. I am the giant Thrym and it was I who stole the hammer of Thor and I have buried it seven leagues below the earth where no man, god or dwarf will find it. If you wish the hammer, I ask one thing. Bring me Lady Freya to be my bride. 
Now, Loki listens to this and he knows that the gods will not agree to this, but he's at a loss. He, he has nothing else. He's got nothing to do, no, no cards to play. So he simply agrees and thinks, I'll need to work this out later. Putting on the cloak, he flies back to Asgard. And arriving in the great city, the first person he meets is none other than Thor. And he tells Thor about Thrym. He tells about Thrym took his hammer and Thrym only asked for one thing for its return, Lady Freya's hand in marriage. Now, I should have explained earlier about Thor. He's a giant of a god. He's a fierce god. He's a terrifying god. To call him the cleverest god, I think I would be lying if I did that. He's not quite the cleverest. You see, all he hears is, Hammer returned Lady Freya's hand in marriage. And to him, it's simple. So you can imagine Lady Freya's shock when this bear of a god grabs her by the wrist and starts to march her out of Asgard, telling her she is going to be married to a giant. But even Thor, the thunderer, knows when he's gone too far, and the wrath of a woman can even cow such a bear of a man, for before he knows it, he is down, huddled as Lady Freya vents and rages at him, and Thor knows he's gone too far. And now once more, the gods gather in the great halls, and they beg and they plead with Lady Freya to do this, because they know they need the hammer, they know how important it is, but Lady Freya is having none of it. And now the gods need to come up with a plan. What are we to do? How are we going to get the hammer back? And it is Heimdall, the ever watchful, who comes up with the solution. You see, he sees everything that happens in all realms at all times. And he knows that Thrym has never actually seen Lady Freya. He has only heard of her beauty. So why not send somebody in disguise in her place? And all the gods, Heindel is so clever, this is a great idea, but who? And that's when Heindel's eyes fall on Thor. And Thor is cheering and roaring at this idea, and then all of a sudden realises what Heindel's meaning. And his demeanour changes. Oh no, no. No, you are not doing that to me. No, no, and triple no. Because, of course, Thor realises all too soon if he is to be dressed as Lady Freya, that means he has to wear a dress. He has to wear a bridal gown. He has to be all prettified. And Thor knows that the gods will make fun of him. For hours, the argument goes back and forwards until Odin, the Allfather, steps in and puts his foot down. It shall be done. And now, with a little bit too much relish and enjoyment, all the goddesses and, and maidens charge around Thor and start their work. They start draping him in fine satins and linens, a wedding dress. They start beading his hair and putting gems in it. They tie his beard in ribbons. They place a veil across his face to hide the beard, placing makeup around his eyes and bedazzling him with jewels, trying to make Thor look as beautiful, as ladylike as they can. And once they are done, they step back to admire their work and, well, it's Thor in a wedding dress. And they realise this isn't going to work. Thor will never pass as Lady Freya without help. And that's when Loki steps in. I will go with Thor. I will change myself into a handmaiden and escort him. Thor needs my cunning and wit to get through this trial. And it was agreed upon, and so it was done. And both gods leave Asgard. Loki, <laughs> wiggling his hips and looking as dainty and as beautiful as any maiden. Thor, kind of walking like an upright bear in a very foul mood. 
And as they walk across the realms, getting closer to Jotunheim, Thor is told that he must at least attempt to look more ladylike. Well, in the keep of Thrym, word has reached him that two goddesses are on their way, or shall we say a goddess and her maiden are on the way, and Thrym realises that the gods are keeping their word. They are sending Lady Freya to him, and he is filled with joy. All of a sudden, he gets a huge feast prepared, tidies the hall, and by that we mean he dusts and maybe pushes a few skulls into the corner. But he makes the place look as glamorous as it can for the most beautiful goddess. Gathering all the giants of his realm together, they wait. And soon enough, the doors open and in walks a vision of beauty with her handmaiden, and Thrym is delighted. He's, he's so happy that the most beautiful goddess is going to be his, and he sits her down at the table beside him. And then he claps his hands, and a feast is brought out, and the feast is sumptuous, and Thor is famished. He looks at all the meats and treats around him, and he can't stop himself. Three oxen, twelve salmon, all the sweet treats he can eat, he devours it all. And as he devours it, Thrym's jaw drops. He cannot believe the appetite of this goddess. And he says so. Now Loki is sitting there, desperately wondering what to do. He, he realises that Thor's gut is going to give the game away. So quickly, he steps in. Uh, 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 you, you're, you're giantness. No, no, no. You misunderstand. Uh, Lady Freya, for days, has fasted. She wanted her waist to be as slim. She wanted to be as beautiful for you as she could be. And now she is in your presence. Her hunger is unleashed. And what you see is her now sating her hunger. She is just famished now that she's beside you. And of course, Thrym on hearing this is like, oh, this is good. And she will fit in here with us giants. She has an appetite of a giant. So all is well. And the feast continues and things are going well. And the mead comes out. Oh, the mead. The honey wine. And of course, if you know of Thor, he loves his honey wine. And all the giants are drinking, but Thor, of course, grabs a barrel, one barrel, two barrels, three barrels, four barrels, five barrels of mead he quaffs down, and the giants try and keep up with him because they don't want to be out drunk by a goddess. How embarrassing. And as the night goes on and the mead takes effect, its effect, because if you know one thing about mead, it makes men very amorous. And of course, Thrym, having drank so much, decides, looking at this vision of beauty beside him, that he must kiss her. He can't contain himself anymore. He must kiss his bride-to-be, and he reaches across to remove the veil as Thor turns and looks at him. And what he sees is the fire in Thor's eyes, the flames of hatred and anger there. And Thrym recoils in fear. Her eyes, her eyes are burning with anger as if she wishes me dead. And of course, Loki, quickly as he can be. Oh, no, no, no. Your giantness, you're mistaken. Um, passion. Yes, it's passion. What you're seeing in Lady Freya's eyes is a longing. Since she heard that you wished to be her husband, her, her, her passion has burned deep inside her. She has longed to be by you in your bed. What you're seeing is love, love and passion. Well, can you imagine Thrym? He had never in his wildest dreams thought that a goddess like Lady Freya would want him so much. And with that news, he can't wait any longer. He needs to be married. With another clap of his hands, he calls for the ceremony to begin. Now, it's about this point that both the gods start to panic. 
Thor, even with the ridiculousness of this situation, never actually thought he would need to be married to the giant. He thought it would be all over before now, so now he starts to panic. And poor Loki's mind is going ten to the dozen as he thinks, how are we going to get out of this? How are we going to get out of this? And then it comes to him. <gasps> Your giantness. May I suggest a wedding gift for Lady Freya? That you bring the hammer of Thor from its hiding place in the earth. Bring it into the hall and place it on her lap. That way, all the gods will know that the giants are trustworthy and it may bond both our tribes together. Now, the food, the drink, the prospect of love has blinded Thrym. And he thinks, is this a marvellous idea? So with another clap of his hands, he orders the hammer to be raised from the earth. And Thor is sitting beside him, trembling and shaking in anger and rage, embarrassment and excitement. And as Thrym looks at him, he takes it for the eagerness for them to be bonded together. But Thor is shaking, desperately trying not to break the chair he sits on, and then into the hall it comes. Molnir, his faithful hammer, desperately he holds still as much as he can, and closer and closer and closer it comes until... <sighs> Peace. As the weight of the hammer is placed on his laps, Thor, for the first time, feels peace, tranquility, a sense of happiness that he hasn't felt in so long. All is well in the world. <sighs> Until his hand wraps round that shaft, and then anger, rage, thunder, lightning, embarrassment and fury fill his body and he leaps up roaring and bellowing in joy at having Molnir once more in his hands. The heavens crack with thunder as he rips off his veil to reveal Oh, that wasn't a spoiler from earlier. Hmm. He is roaring, he's bellowing, he's cheering, and he rips off the wedding dress to reveal far too much Thor. But he's filled with rage, he's filled with anger, and he needs to vent, and his handsome husband-to-be is the first to feel his vengeance. With one blow of Molnir, he is killed, sent crashing against the wall. But Thor is angry. Thor is embarrassed, and this is not enough. He stalks around the castle, killing every giant, every troll, every living creature he can find. Smashing walls, smashing furniture, smashing skulls until at last it is but him and Loki left alive. Thor is still angry. The heavens are filled with thunder and lightning. But it's now time to return to Asgard. And the two gods start their long, weary trek. All the while the heavens are lit up with Thor's anger. On the walls of Asgard, the gods are waiting. And in the distance, they see the thunder. Sorry, they hear the thunder. They see the lightning across the heavens. And they know Thor is returning. And when Thor is within sight of Asgard, he raises his hammer high. And the heavens are filled with thunder, lightning, and cheers from the gods of Asgard. Asgard, for they know that they will once more be able to rest well in their beds, knowing that Molnir and Thor are once again united. And that is the story of how Thor lost and regained his hammer. But there is a moral to this story. I believe Paul 
mentioned it, how terrible a guest Thor can be. So if I can humbly impart one piece of advice on you, there will come a time in everyone's lives, it may have already happened, but if there are younger viewers listening, that you may fall in love, you may feel quite enchanted by someone and decide that you want to spend your life with them. So you'll decide to get married and you'll make your lists and your preparations and you'll send out invitations to guests. Now, oddly enough, this happened to me last year. I got married and as we were making the lists, um, I happened to notice a name had appeared on it and I looked at it and I, I laughed and then I very quickly scored it out because I thought, no, no, that one person is not coming to my wedding. And it wasn't Paul or Nick because they're lovely people, but it was another individual. And if you happen to make a list and you go to send out your invitations, you may see that name appear as well. It often happens. But I promise you, you need to score it out. Make sure to score it out and not send them an invitation because the last thing you ever want to do is have Thor as a wedding guest at any of your events or your greatest day of all because he is bound to get too drunk, too rowdy and potentially smash the place up with his hammer. But at least he still has his hammer for that is how Thor nearly got married and how Thor got Molnir back. Thank you. Oh, well, guys, I'm going to wrap it up there because my throat is starting to, to go. My, my nose is getting blocked with the, the dryness in this room as well. It's the downside to having a, um, a recording studio is it is pretty um, airtight to a degree. So there's no ventilators or nothing in here. So a vent becomes a sauna. So I want to thank you all for joining. Thank you for all the lovely interaction, all the comments. I always appreciate that. Um, I hope you've had but this is a free event. Um, there is an option to tip. There is a tip jar. I'm just being brutally honest. This is me paying it forward. If anyone did enjoy, I always put a wee tip bar because as a performer, most of us are out of work at the moment, but it is up to yourselves and it's not a prerequisite for these uh, Facebook live shows. However, what I do say is, is I have copies of my Scottish Bedtime Stories download card. This is a collection of gruesome and grisly Scottish tales. Uh, it is a digital copy and if anyone tips $15, I'm sure your email is there and you will get a copy of this if you haven't already bought the CD, which probably most of you have. I've got a few to send out. I got a few tips from an event a couple of days ago and I know there's a few I still to send out. But folks, thank you for joining. I'm trying to do Facebook uh, every day, a big one at least once a week. Thanks very much for joining. I'll maybe see you tomorrow. I might take the day off tomorrow. Let my... um. Uh, energy levels rise but if I'm on come and join me sometimes it's just a chat with a story sometimes it's just a ramble to see how everyone's on and sometimes it's a story session but it's been an absolute pleasure as always thank you for joining thanks to the Viking guys that joined uh, my Edmonton friends the people from Sedgwick people from the UK uh, love you all it's been a pleasure and I'll hopefully see you all soon and hopefully we'll get to see each other in person soon because um Speaking to camera is really, really not doing it for me, although I do enjoy what I do. So thanks very much. Love you all.